I, I mentioned before that um, that uh, song was written um, basically while the preacher at w one church was preaching. The worship leader started writing down this song while the preacher was preaching his sermon, and then they had the break for Sunday school. The, the song leader finished the song during Sunday school, and they performed it at the second service. I, I think that was just, it's amazing that people can, can do that. It's also amazing that people use sermon time for, for helpful things, I guess. Um, we continue today with our study of the book of Philippians. There's an old story about a, um, a church in western Kentucky back at uh, in the late 1890s that... Um, it was a small church in a farming community. They had two deacons that sort of ran uh, the, the church, and they were kind of had a hard folks to get along with, and they had a hard time getting along with each other. One of them put up a peg on the back wall so the pastor could hang his hat because, you know, all preachers need a place to hang their hat. And, and, but the other deacon got really upset when he did that because the church bylaws said that no uh, changes to the building could be done unless there was a vote of the full board which there was two deacons, that was the whole board. And so because he didn't get any input, he took the peg down. Well, the other deacon put it back up, and so he took it back down. And they did that for several weeks until they got in a big argument after church, and people chose sides. Well, to make a long story short, if you go to that little community today, you'll find two Baptist churches, the Pegite Baptist Church and the Anipeg Baptist Church which seems kind of silly, but about the same time, our movement was having disagreements and arguments of our own. The Stone and Campbell Restoration Movement, of which we are a part, uh, began as a unity movement. But pretty soon, we start putting up pegs, and we started arguing about those pegs. First, instrumental music, and then missionary societies, and, and then there was orphans' homes, and then there were Sunday school classes, there was even one group that said it was sinful to pay preachers, heretics. <laughs> We've been, unfortunately, a whole lot better about dividing than we have about following Jesus' commandment to stay together, to stay unified, to be as unified as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, we convinced ourselves that all of those arguments was about what's right, but in reality... What they were about is who gets to have their way. That's where most arguments come from. Well, as we continue our look at Philippians, we remind ourselves that there was a group of Pegites in the church at Philippians. Philippi was a church Paul was the closest to. We've been mentioning that all along, that uh, he had a close relationship from the second missionary journey but onward that they supported him in part uh, of the second missionary journey, parts of the third missionary journey. They sent funds. And then when he was in prison, they sent gifts to him there. And he, you can just see all through this book how much Paul loves these folks. In Philippians 4 and verse 1, which is the beginning of our text for this morning. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my dear friends. This the love and appreciation dripping off of Paul. And we've seen that all through the book. In fact, how similar is this to what we just read? This is all the way back in chapter 1. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of of Jesus Christ. Paul loves these folks. But the point of the letter is he wants them to love each other. And that is, uh, that's the struggle as we go on. As we go back to chapter 4, verse 1, the beginning of the last chapter. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, after talking about how much he loves them. In what way? Stand firm in this way. Well, he just talked about and what we looked at last week, how they were to follow the right examples because there were so many wrong examples. Follow my example, he said, and people like me don't follow the example of those folks that are causing trouble. Some of the trouble at uh, Philippi was caused by these Judaizing teachers that he warns them about, these people that are adding uh, hoops to jump through and rules uh, to keep any time that you add rules and expect other people to follow your rules. 
there's going to be conflict. Paul calls these people enemies of the cross. But I think as we go into the fourth chapter, we see what might have been the real problem at Philippi. Not just about these false teachers, but he mentions a couple of sisters by name. And I think this is what's going on in the book. Here's what he writes. I plead with Euodah and I plead with Seneca to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Two sisters. One of them is named Euoda and the other is Seneca. Now here's what we know about these women. One is named Euoda, and the other is named Seneca. That's all we know. We also know their names mean pleasant journey and good luck. Um, they're also Greek names, so these are not Jewish people. And we also know from what he says, they're not being very pleasant, and they're not bringing a lot of good luck. There's evidently a disagreement between the two of them that are causing problems in the church. What so often happens when two prominent members, and we'll see that in a second, have a disagreement that that can spill over. It's just natural that what happens if we have a disagreement, a fight, then you and your bunch go over in that corner, and me and my bunch, we go over in the other corner, and we talk about each other. And evidently, that's what's happening at Philippi, at least to a degree. Now, we don't know what the disagreement is over. It could have been over you know, which one had the best green bean casserole uh, at potlucks. Uh, probably something more significant than that. Um, now, when you think about first century churches, you've got to kind of think differently. Uh, they didn't conduct business the way that we do in a lot of significant ways. They were much more participatory uh, people wouldn't have been sitting in a dark room listening to somebody do all the talking. Um, the other way that they were different is they didn't have a building at all. We know from what uh, we read in Acts 16, the very first church at Philippi was hosted by a woman named Lydia. She's not mentioned in the book, either because she wasn't causing trouble or because maybe she's moved on. But it was very common for there to be multiple house churches in the same city that were considered part of the same church. Paul often greets and greet the church that is at so-and-so's house. So it could have been that you and Seneca are simply hostesses of different house churches, and for some reason they've gotten a competition thing going, and that's what was causing uh, trouble. We don't know the reason. Maybe one of them put up a peg or something. Um, what we do know is that they are prominent enough for Paul to mention and also refer to his past relationship with them. Like the Pegites, their issues were causing issues in the church, so Paul briefly addresses them and asks for help in getting these two sisters to get along with one another. <clears throat> so the first part of Philippians chapter 4 is specifically... Um, what he mentions about these two sisters. Now, full disclosure here, we're only going to look at these two verses, the two verses that I just read of Paul talking to Euoda and Seneca. I had planned on doing half of chapter 4 today and finishing the book next week, but there's just too much good stuff here. So I split today's lesson into two because I figured that at least someone here wants to get done in time for lunch uh, today, But there's a lot of good things that are said here that we can apply to our own struggles. He's going to appeal to someone he calls true companion. And in doing so, he calls on us to be true companions as well. So let me mention three things that we see in these two short verses. First of all, he pleads with them to be of the same mind. So he says, I plead with you at a... And I plead with Seneca to be of the same mind in the Lord. You know the problem when you get mad at someone, you give them a piece of your mind, it means you've lost part of yours. I mean, think that's what happens when we get angry and we say something, it's like we lose our mind. That's why when we get angry, we talk about being mad. 
<laughs> well, mad originally was talking about insanity because somebody that's really angry acts totally insane. So what Paul says is you need to get your mind back. You need to be of the same mind. In fact, what he says here sounds an awful lot like what he said um, uh, earlier in the book when talking to the general group. Philippians 2 and verse 2. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Now, we looked at this in detail in an earlier lesson, and we mentioned that in reality what Paul is doing is uh, doing what we sometimes do when we're trying to emphasize something. You use synonyms, things that actually say the same thing, to stress your point. So what he says literally here is, I want you to have one mind, one love, one mind, and one mind. Well, he's saying that to the whole group. Um, you need to be more like-minded. But as we get to chapter 4, we get the idea that maybe he had Yuda and Seneca in mind all along. Now, he's going to play his trump card a couple of verses after this, and he's going to say, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So why don't you emulate Christ here rather than acting like a bunch of lunatics? But before he brings Jesus into it, he says this about having one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Well, in reality, when he tells Yuda and Seneca uh, to be of the same mind, he's saying the same thing that he says here. And I want to suggest to you that when we read Philippians 2, 3, and 4, where he's talking about do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. He's talking to the whole church. He's talking to us. But he was specifically talking to Yuida and Seneca and their problem. Now understand this. I think we mentioned this before. When Paul wrote letters, he fully expected those letters to be read publicly in the church. If we were just to read Philippians together someone that's a good reader and um, has a lot, you know, put something into it, a little inflection, a little pause, you know, it would take about 20 minutes to read the book. Now, I know what you're thinking. We're taking 12 weeks to work through it. It only take 20 minutes to, uh, to, to, to read it. But yeah, it's, so it was read publicly. Think about that. That means as Paul, as, as his letter is being read to the whole church, and he mentions Yuda and Seneca, Yuda is sitting right there, Seneca is sitting over there. Or at least at their different house churches, they're sitting in the group as this letter is being read. Can you imagine the side eye that's going on? as they're listing, but everybody's looking over at one or the other. I mean, imagine getting called down in church. Um, it would be, particularly when you're being reprimanded, which is essentially what Paul is doing uh, here. And I think probably that is, uh, there were some side eyes going on in chapter 2, as Paul reads do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Probably the church knew exactly who was talked about here. Now understand, having the same mind does not mean agreeing on everything. Because if Paul meant for Yuda and Seneca to agree on everything, that would, in essence, make unity impossible. Let me illustrate it this way. Sometimes the dumbest thing that I, that I hear preachers saying is when I go back and read some of my old sermons. I don't agree with myself. And if I can study something and come to a different conclusion that I used to have, okay, just for the sake of argument, I'm right about everything now, but back then, you know, there were some things that I was off on. You know, if... If we grow to the point where we disagree with ourselves about some things, can we really expect to come to the same conclusions 
about practices and doctrines and the best way to do things. Of course we can't. Whatever Paul is telling you at Seneca here, it is not be exactly on the same page about every issue that could come down the pike. But while we can't agree on everything, we can be agreeable all the time. We can always be humble, free of conceit, and not insisting on having our own way, but rather seeking to serve others. The things that Paul said, as we saw back in Philippians chapter 2. We can't always agree, but we can always be uh, agreeable. They are to have the same mind in the Lord. As long as we focus on the Lord, uh, we'll have a better chance of getting along with one another. It's when I decide that I'm the one that everybody needs to agree with. Or you decide you're the one that everybody needs to agree with. When we take our minds off of Jesus, that's when we find ourselves at cross purposes. Secondly, sometimes you just need a little help in working out some issues. So he writes, yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these people since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. So he calls on somebody that he refers to here as true companion, or some translations, loyal yoke fellow. The Greek word here that is translated true companion is kimosabe. No, no, that's not right. That's the Lone Ranger. But it really means the same thing. Uh, the word actually in the Greek is syzygous, that some translations, almost all translations, give this an alternative in your footnote. If you've got your Bible open, look down the footnote, it'll probably tell you that syzygous can be translated as a proper name. So it may be somebody named Sisyphus, or it may be somebody that he's referring to as true companion, that everyone would have known who he was talking to, maybe Epaphroditus, who was the one that brought the letter uh, to Philippi. But you need to help these later, ladies get along, and you'll be a true companion uh, if you uh, do that. Remember what Jesus says to do if somebody sins against us? We are to immediately go to the elders and pitch a fit. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. Remember what Jesus said to do. Go to the person, just them and you, privately. Some translations say, go to them privately and work it out. And if they listen, then you've won your brother. Relationship's restored and there's no more problem. But what does he say to do if they won't listen to you? You still can't see things eye to eye. Maybe they don't admit they did anything wrong. Maybe they don't admit that you even have a point. What are you supposed to do? You take someone with you as a mediator. Take two or three others. That's what Paul is telling the church here. Sisyphus, or this true companion person, is to act as the mediator. To help these two sisters to see things as they should. See, what happens is we usually put off, if, if somebody um, sins against us, even if we do the right thing and don't talk about it to other people, because that's usually what we do, right? We go, do you know what so-and-so said? Do you know what so-and-so did? And, and pretty much half the church is going to know about that issue before we ever address it with the person. But even if we don't do that, the other thing that we do is we don't say nothing at all. We just smolder. And we start treating that person kind of passive-aggressively, taking little digs now and, and then uh, to, to, make, uh, to show. But we won't address it personally. But what happens when you do that sort of thing, those disagreements fester. And small problems can become large problems because we don't deal with them the way that we should. And why don't we? Why don't we act like true companions to step in as moderators, as mediators, as referees to help people when they're having fusses like that? Well, first of all, what we do is we convince ourselves, it's not my issue. It's not my problem. It's not my circus and not my monkeys. And Jesus tells us that we're wrong. Both Jesus and his little brother James 
tells us that the people that follow God have a role to play whenever their brothers and sisters are in a uh, spat. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. If we're the children, there's equivalency here. If you're a peacemaker, then you're a child of God. But doesn't it work the other way? If we're a child of God, then we're to be peacemakers. James puts it like this. Wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, uh, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Uh, that's the wisdom that comes from above. And he continues, peacemakers who sow peace reap a harvest of righteousness. When we act as peacekeepers, peacemakers, we, um, we act as people that are promoting righteousness. Now, wait a minute. If I'm going to act as a peacemaker... And you've got an issue with someone, and I come, and I, I'm going to try to be a peacemaker, like a, a, a true companion, as Paul says. Doesn't that take a little tact? No. It takes a whole lot of tact. It takes a whole lot of prayer. Because what peacemakers do is... Um, I understand that uh, police officers, and I hesitate to use this illustration since we have one sitting here, but police officers uh, look forward the least to coming into a domestic violence situation, domestic dispute, because the minute you try to mediate an argument between husband and wife or between family, you're in a danger of alienated both sides because what you're doing is you're stepping into a fight between the people that are fighting. But that's the peacemaker position. You cannot be a peacemaker without endangering yourself. Here's what Paul said um, in Galatians 6 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught into sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves. You know, watch yourself. Um, or you may also may be tempted to carry one another's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. If we are living by the Spirit, then we don't have any option other than to act as peacemakers. We see someone overtaken. It may be a pr private sin. They, they're, they're struggling with an addiction or something. Or it may be a sin that they're having a problem with another person. We are to help them carry that burden but we can't do that without getting close enough maybe to get in trouble ourselves. It is dangerous. It's too easy to get caught in the crossfire. But it is in the middle exactly where peacemakers do their work. Now, if you and I are having a disagreement, What do your friends, or what do you rather, what do you expect of your friends? We've just had this big blow up, and, and you go off, and one of your friends comes to you. What do you expect from them? You expect them to take your side. You expect loyalty. And that's why it is that being a peacemaker is so dangerous. Because when you go and try to mediate between two people that are brothers and sisters in Christ, and they're having an issue with one another, You've got to be seen, to be a mediator, you've got to be seen as not taking a side. But when you don't take a side, then you're immediately looked at as being disloyal. That's the problem that we have with our political situation today. You can't, if you're a Republican, you can't say, well, you know, uh, President Biden's got a good point there. I think that because all of a sudden, all of your buddies j jump on you because you're being disloyal. The, the, the same thing if you're a Democrat and you say, well, you know, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell, I think he's right on when he says you can't do that. You've got to take sides. And that's the one thing peacemakers can't do. We have to step between people and mediate the grace of God to people that are so upset that they can't see what is really true and truly real. God calls us all to be com true companions who help to mediate issues. And then third, Paul wants us to remember the past service. Okay, you and Seneca are having issues, but here's what he says. He, he wants 
true companion to help mediate that. And then he says about them, they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Well, first of all, whatever the issue was, I think we're safe to assume that whatever they're arguing about, whether it was practical or doctrinal or scriptural or, or green bean casserole-ish, um, that it wasn't a matter of salvation, right? Their names are written in the book of life. This isn't about heaven and hell. This is about getting people that love God to get along with each other. Um, they love God. They're just struggling to get along with each other right now. And so Paul says, don't let their uh, disagreement now obscure what they've done in the past and how valuable they are in the eyes of God. Years ago, we had a certain member that um, considered it to be their mission to get on my last nerve. Just really had some issues uh, getting along. And, um, of course, the, the, the person that I, the um, uh, only person I can talk to about those kinds of things is my wife. So I'm talking about that. And, and this very wise woman that God gave me says, well, you know, they've done an awful lot of good for an awful lot of people in the past. Sometimes you've just, you've just got to take the bad along with the good. Not what I wanted to hear, <laughs> but absolutely the truth that... And here's the thing to remember, as I'm just struggling to get to understand why, where that person is coming from and why they're being so difficult. And, and, and I'm thinking, well, you know, they've really done, they've blessed a lot of people, they've done a lot of good things in the past. What I need to remember is they've probably got someone patting them on the back saying, well, you know, he's done a lot of good in the past and he's been good for a lot of people in the past. You just got to give him a break here. You see, there's always two sides uh, to every argument. And that's where peacemakers come in to point those things out. Um, you know, eternity is a really, really long time. You know how long eternity is? I heard somebody say, the best thing that we can comprehend and compare to when uh, trying to, uh, to understand how long eternity is the NBA playoffs. That just, you know, almost uh, seems like eternity. Um, if we're going to have to get along with those folks in eternity. He's already said, you and Seneca, they're right there in the book of life. <laughs> so boy, you better start learning how to get along with them now because eternity certainly is going to be a long time. Story that I borrow in from Tony Evans uh, talks about an insane asylum where uh, some uh, you know, a visitor comes and on, on the grounds of this insane asylum are all of these uh, lunatics. Because you've you got to be a lunatic to get in the insane asylum. So all these crazy people are walking along. Only one guard. Guard's walking around just, uh, you know, maybe twirling his nightstick or whatever. And the person is just aghast. And they walk up to the person and said, all of these lunatics here, aren't you afraid for your, your safety? And the guard just kind of smiles and, and uh, chuckles to himself. And, but the, the visitor is having none of it. He says, aren't you, there are so many of these people. Aren't you afraid for your safety? And the guard says, the one thing lunatics never do is unite. <laughs> and maybe that's the reason the church hasn't been any better at our calling of influencing the world and pointing the world to Jesus is we've acted like a bunch of lunatics. We haven't been very good in uniting. We are too interested in making sure we get things our way. We're not willing to let God have his way, which is for us to live together in unity. Amen. Conflicts happen. Every family and in every church. The question is, what are we going to do about it when those conflicts take place? Are we going to be so laser focused on winning the conflict that we lose our identity as the people of God? May God help us to work together for the glory of the kingdom. May God help us to be witnesses to his righteousness in the world today. And that cannot happen if we first don't learn to get along with each other.
May we all be the true companion that Paul calls for here. Let's pray together.